Do you still fall for that old gag? Yeah. Hi, Tim. Good afternoon, Captain. You better call me Dick. We're going to be doing a lot of talking in the next few hours. Fine, that suits me. Let's have a look at the weather. Weather good. Clear and unlimited. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Looking forward to your first ride in the B-26, Jim? Certainly am. See, it's a break getting into your flight. I've been promoting ever since I first saw you in pre-flight school. Took some doing. Thanks. I hope I'll be a credit to you. you. Better be. Remember in college when I was your student instructor in math? I took a lot of trouble with you, Dick. If you're as dumb as I was, I'll wash you out. <laughs> There she is. Where's the checklist, Corporal Smith? Sorry, sir, I forgot it. It's our engineer. He's almost as green as you are. Me, green? I had 80 hours of twin engine school. I'm almost ripe enough to be picked. What I can understand is how year after year the Air Corps keeps getting them so young and innocent. Here's the checklist, sir. Take a look, Jim. Since you're going to be a B-26 pilot, that's your Bible. As far as you're concerned, life begins with the checklist. And it may end if you don't use it. The checklist is first in war, first in peace, and the first thing you reach for in a B-26. Understand? No, you take it. I want you to make this check yourself. We'll do the before entering airplane check. Take over. Uh, left landing gear and wheel well check. Well, that uh, U-lock the crew member's removing is a safety precaution we have to prevent anyone from raising the landing gear while the ship's on the ground. You don't mean to tell me that's ever happened. That and worse. Now get on with that checklist and see that none of those other things ever happen to you. Tired for blisters, cuts, proper inflation, slipping on rim. Notice the red mark on your rim. That'll show you if your tires slip. Oil strut for proper extension. Correct? Right. Now maybe here's where I'd better do a little pointing out. There's your gear-operated load and fire valve piston. Make sure it's fully extended. Check brake for excessive heat, right? Check your brake shuttle valve for looseness. Hydraulic lines for excessive leakage. Down lock pin engaged. Let's go. This is the camera door. Check ballast for proper loading. You must have sufficient ballast back here in order to have a stable airplane. In this case, it's sandbags instead of guns and ammunition, but the weight must be there, whatever it may be. Without the sandbags, the nose is very heavy on landing, and it's impossible to keep from beating up your nose gear. Here's your fire extinguisher. See that it's in position and properly secure. Uh, what do we check on the putt button? Make sure the equalizer switch is off, and see that all cushions or parachutes are away from the muffler. They might start a fire. Next, right landing gear and wheel well check. You do that yourself, exactly the same as we did the left. Oh, there's the red signal on your Lux fire extinguisher. That's a quick way of knowing from the outside that the extinguisher has not been discharged. Inspection of the nose gear, same as that of the main gear. Go ahead. Trouble Smith, will you get in the cockpit and operate the controls for us? Yes, sir. Now, this next check is to make certain that we always have free and maximum movement of ailerons, elevators, rudder, and attached trim tabs. I'll give the commands to Corporal Smith for operating the controls, and you go back in the rear and check they're working properly. Full left rudder. 
Full right rudder. Rudder trim tab to hold full right rudder. Now all the way left. Turn the wheel all the way left. Now all the way right. Aileron trim tab to lower right wing. Now all the way to lower left wing. Stick all the way back. All the way forward. Elevator trim tab wheel all the way forward. Now all the way back. Set all trim tabs and take off position. Flaps all the way down. Flaps and take off position. Flaps all the way up. All's well with the flipper, Skipper. Good. Incidentally, you always taxi with your flaps in the up position. Did you personally check the air pressure in the emergency Bombay bottle? Yes, sir. It was 1,800 pounds. How were the batteries on the pre-flight inspection this morning? They were well charged, and I entered the readings for the emergency Bombay bottle and the batteries on Form 1A. Good. Have one of you men get in and get ready to start the putt-putt. Yes, sir. You understand the purpose of the putt-putt, don't you, Jim? Yeah. It gives it right here on the checklist. All engine starts will be made with an auxiliary power plant or an external source of electrical power except an emergency. Conserve electricity until after takeoff. And that's really important. You don't want a heavy drain on your batteries until after your engine-driven generators are putting out continuously. And that won't be until you're flying. Putt-putt will also come in handy in flight if your generators ever cut out on you. That putt-putt seems practically indispensable. It is. Whenever anybody on the ground uses any electrical equipment, the putt-putt must be kept running to keep the batteries charged. That's law, like always using a checklist. You must have electricity for the takeoff, especially for the electric props. Well, that's how most runaway props occur, isn't it? Yeah, run down batteries. Well, if we don't call it a runaway prop, it's really an overspeeding engine running away with a fixed pitch prop. Let's see. This is the after entering airplane section. Check flight hydraulic servicing can for full service. Tap it on the side to see if it's full. Then fuel transfer valves. They're in the forward bomb bay. Transfer valves off. Fuel transfer pump off. Fuel valves on. Both of them. Hydraulic tank fully serviced. Bomb rack switches on tanks if extra fuel tanks are carried. On bombs if no tanks are carried. In this case, we're carrying an extra fuel tank, so it's on tanks. The rest of the stuff is in the navigator's compartment. Generator switches off. Check pressure, emergency brake air bottle. That's there onto the navigator's table. And check that the valve is open as placarded. And make sure that this bleed valve up here ahead in the cockpit is closed. That's it. your emergency hydraulic tank. Make certain it's fully serviced.
check your hatch hinges and emergency release handle. Sit there in position. Okay. Close them up. Check your safety pins in place. Give me some pressure on the hydraulic hand pump so I can set the parking brake. How long do I keep this up? Well, you can't pump anymore. Until the hydraulic gauge shows the pressure's up. That's okay now. Take a look outside. But hasn't been done within the previous hour. Both props are turned over by hand, two or three revolutions, for the ignition off. Just to clear out any oil that may have settled in the lower cylinder. You've been in the Air Corps long enough, Jim, to know the importance of checking Form 1A. No red diagonals, gas, wing tanks, and one bomb bay full, oil full, no other remarks. What's your serial number? 0918162. Say that or dial it. <laughs> Leave your inner side earphone off so we can hear each other. Let's see. Next is the starting engines check. Yeah, watch me. Throttle one eighth open. Cowl flaps open. Wing flap control up. Landing gear control down, lock on. Supercharger low, guard over controls. Oil shutters open. Carburetor air cold. Primers off until actually starting engine. Fuel booster off until ready to start engine. Nose gear emergency control normal, up. Main gear emergency control normal, up. Mixture idle cutoff. Propeller controls high RPM, forward. Selectors automatic, safety's on. Feathering normal to the rear. Battery switches both on. Master ignition switch on. That's the emergency bell button there. On the ground, we use that as a signal to the crew member in the rear to start the putt button. By cutting your battery switches for an instant and looking at your landing gear position indicators, you can tell if your putt putt's putting out juice. Main inverter switch on. Spare inverter off. Magneto switch on. I'm going to start the left engine first. Clear. Clear. Here's how we get them started, Jim. Start your energizing switch on for about 30 seconds. Booster pump on. Primer on for about five seconds. Then I press the engaging switch. Now it's your job to shove the mixture control to auto rich the moment the engine fires. it is. As soon as the engine's running, throttle back to between 800 and 1,000 RPM till it's warmed up. You'll notice your oil pressure goes up to around 200 pounds. If you don't get the oil pressure within 15 seconds, stop the engine and investigate. Wonderful. You're learning. Auto Rich Anthony, they call me. Okay, now you can turn your boosters off. You'll know your motors are warmed up when the oil temperature gauge hits 40 degrees and the oil pressure drops suddenly to normal. The cylinder head temperature gauge will read from 100 to 200 degrees. They're okay now. Then you hit your emergency bell button again. That's a signal to the crew member back there to shut off the putt button and get out of the airplane.
we don't turn on the radio until we're ready to taxi out. It's the co-pilot's duty to handle radio conversation. Tower from 7645, on south end of ramp, ready to taxi out for takeoff. Go ahead. 7645 from the tower. Clear to taxi to the north end of the north-south taxi strip and stand by for takeoff. Go ahead. 7645, roger. Ready to go, Corporal? Okay, sir. One thing you must always remember is that you're in a ship with a tricycle landing gear. The nose wheel must never be turned to an angle of more than 40 degrees to either side. Did you see that red sign on the nose wheel when you inspected the well? Yes, I did, Dick. You'll notice it's easy to taxi the ship and there's no need for taxiing fat. In making a turn, always keep the inside gear rolling. Never bring it to a complete stop, as is often done in airplanes with conventional gear. And keep your eyes open on the ground or in the air. It isn't the airplane, it's what you hit with it. When you park, always make certain that your nose wheel is straight ahead. Otherwise, running up your separate engines, the airplane has a tendency to turn in the direction in which the nose wheel is cocked. The thrust from one of the engines might damage the nose wheel assembly. Corporal Smith is checking now to see if the nose wheel is straight. I get you, Captain. Next is the engine run up and prop check, one engine at a time. Push it up till it's doing 2,000 RPM. Different engines have slightly different manifold pressure readings. Is that the RPM in which you check the max? Yeah. Look at your checklist. That's first. I'm sorry. Put your propeller selector switch and decrease RPM. And watch how the RPM falls off on the tachometer. As soon as you see it drop, return the selector switch to increase RPM. And notice how the tachometer shows increase back to 2,000. Do you hear how the sound of the propeller changes? You can hardly miss it. That's right. Put your propeller selector switch in automatic and test your propeller pitch control handle. Pull it part way back until the RPM decreases 200 revolutions, keeping your eye on the tachometer. Then push it forward, watching the tachometer to see that it returns to 2,000 RPM. The next step is to throttle back to 1400 and do the same thing with the other engine. Now you run your engines up together to about 1800. At the same time checking your manifold pressure against the RPM. Be sure that both engines are putting out approximately the same power. We'll check the generators. If Corporal Smith finds the ammeters are showing more than 10 amps difference, we'll give this airplane back to the crew chief. Generators are okay. Oil temperature is 60 to 80. Oil pressure is 75 to 85. Check. Fuel pressure with booster pumps off, 15 to 17. Check. Turn the boosters on. Yeah. Should be 12 to 17 pounds now. Check. It's a takeoff checklist next. Right. Check instrument panel for placarded operations instructions. Cow flaps. Open for all ground operation. 
Wing flaps down one quarter to one half as required. Remove landing gear control lock. Supercharger low. Oil cooler shutters open except during extremely cold weather. Carburetor air control, cold. Hydraulic pressure, 750 to 950 pounds per square inch. Booster pumps on, primers off. Nose gear emergency control, normal up. Main gear emergency control, normal up. Mixture control, auto rich. Propeller controls, high RPM, forward. Propeller switches, selector, automatic. Safety on, feathering normal. Batteries on. Are the generator mainline switches on, Corporal? Generator is okay, sir. Don't start takeoff of cylinder temperature above 205 degrees centigrade. Rudder and aileron tabs on zero. Elevator trim tab a few degrees tail heavy. Crew in position for takeoff. All set, Corporal? All set, sir. Now you have definite duties during the takeoff. Watch the tachometer and see that it doesn't exceed 2,600 RPM. Your right hand should be bare and ready to handle the propeller switches. Your left hand is used to raise the landing gear. Here's how you put your hand. By keeping your right hand down on the quadrant, you can keep the throttles from creeping back during takeoff. If your tachometer should show an increase above 2,600, say 2,880, put your propeller selector switch in fixed pitch position. Then hit your feather switch for about two seconds being sure to return it to normal position. That's the procedure for correcting an overspeeding engine. The other emergency procedure to be prepared for is a decreasing RPM prop. Your props will be in automatic position, which is normal for takeoff. So if one of them shows a decrease RPM, put the selector switch in increased position and bring the RPM back to 2600. Then leave your selector switch in fixed pitch position. Understand? Yeah. Now, under no condition, retract the wheels until you get a definite signal from me. My hand will be on top of the throttles, and this will be it. Roger. Okay, call the tower. Tower from 7645, north in a north-south taxi strip, ready to take off. Go ahead. 7645 from the tower, standby. Ship landing. Go ahead. 7645, Wilco. Watch this ship coming in. Give you a chance to see a normal B-26 landing. Notice his nose drop. He's putting his flaps down now. As soon as they're down, he'll check his hydraulic pressure to be sure he has brakes. He establishes a glide of 140 miles per hour and holds it till he gets almost to the ground. Then he flares and comes on in normal landing. See how he holds his nose wheel high and lets it down easy before he loses airspeed control. Then he applies his brakes gradually and turns off the runway. Get the idea? I think so. Shall I call the tower? Yeah. Tower from 7645. Is it clear to take off? Go ahead. 7645 from the tower. You're clear to take off to the south on runway 14. Go ahead. 7645. Roger. I'm going to take off with 44 inches manifold pressure and 2,600 RPM. That's minimum. But if you need it, the manifold pressure can be pushed up to the red mark at 49 inches on this particular model. After the roll is started, you use very little brakes to keep the ship straight. Lateral control should be maintained by the rudder only after you're a short way down the runway. As soon as you can, get the nose wheel off and hold the ship in a slightly nose-high attitude. When you have enough speed, the ship will take off by itself. You don't have to pull it off the ground. And it's got very little torque. You could pull it off at about 110 miles per hour if you were on a short field. But it'll fly itself off at about 130 miles an hour. back now to normal rated power, which is 38 inches of manifold pressure. Give me 2,400 RPM on the propeller pitch control. 
2400. What were you watching during the takeoff? Psychometer, manifold pressure gauge, and your thumb. You ever get to be a B-26 pilot? Don't waste any time giving the signal to get that gear up for the moment you're sure you're off the ground. Because? Because when you run out of runway, your landing gear is no good to you. Pretty tough getting to 160 miles per hour until that gear is tucked away. I see what you mean. Well, we're climbing now. We do that at exactly 160 miles per hour until the flaps are raised. The airplane should be at least 800 feet above the ground before you raise it. This is what is known as milking them up. You do it a little at a time and you keep your hand on the flap handle until the flaps are all the way up. If you don't and they should come up on one side only, you'll go into the most violent bank you ever saw in your life. But you can stop it by putting the flaps back down again. Can I take my eyes off the tachometer? Yeah. Put them on the hydraulic controls. It's time to neutralize them. All air work is done with cow flaps, wing flaps, landing gear, and oil cooler shutters in neutral position at all times in order to prevent loss of hydraulic fluid from the entire system in case one of the individual lines develops a serious leak. Turn off your boosters. Airspeed indicator says we're picking up speed. With the flaps up, the ship changes its attitude. You'll notice our nose has come up a bit and gains about 10 miles per hour. With the cow flaps half closed and the oil cooler flaps half closed, it streamlines the airplane to the, to the extent that it picks up about five miles per hour more. But you must not forget that these controls should be handled in accordance with cylinder head and oil temperature. Really claws her way right up into those clouds, doesn't she? You fly her for a while, Jim. Get the feel of the controls. See how easily she handles. Nice. Try some shallow dives and climbs and a couple of gentle turns. Controls are easy, aren't they? Smooth as a GI haircut. Easy to coordinate, too. Hey, you're skidding, sonny boy. Take a look at that turn and bank indicator. What cause is that? Something I forgot to tell you. The plane has a very sensitive rudder and you'll skid on all your turns if you don't correct for them. Try it again. Another advantage of the B-26 is that it can be dived up to 325 miles per hour with a heavy load and pulled out without an appreciable strain on the airplane. But diving is about your one luxury. Side slips, vertical banks, and all acrobatics are prohibited maneuver. I'll try to go straight and level, Dick. Try a 40-degree bank. That's the maximum. By the way, the B-26 is a good airplane to go to war in. It's got plenty of power, plenty of armor plate, and plenty of guns. I'm beginning to think it's a good plane to go anywhere in. Let me take over for a minute. I want to show you a power-off stall. Power-on stalls are prohibited in the B-26. This one will be with the nose not over 10 degrees above the horizon. She stalls at about 125 miles per hour with the flaps and landing gear retracted. About 115 miles per hour with the flaps down, and about 100 miles an hour with flaps and landing gear down. Notice the pronounced shuddering just before the stall. You'll also feel the lack of control when the control surfaces are moved. These are important points to remember, since it means that the airplane will always give you plenty of warning. An 
Another advantage is that it falls straight forward from this type of stall with no tendency to drop off on either wing. Of course, in power on or nose high stalls, it may fall off on one wing. Normal stall recovery is very simple. You just put the nose down and let the ship pick up speed by itself. Loading is an important consideration in respect to stalling. If the ship is improperly loaded, the tail is too heavy and therefore the center of gravity too far to the rear, it will affect the stalling characteristics of the airplane by making it stall at a higher speed and with less warning. Improper loadings also have to put you into a spin. That spin business fascinates me. Just how do you get out of one? Cut your power off and make a normal spin recovery. Don't be slow and cautious in the movement of your controls during recovery. And avoid getting impatient waiting for the controls to take effect. Sometimes they need a little while before they begin to work. The only way you can judge time is by counting the number of turns made. Don't use your throttle except as a last resort. When you're free of the spin, pull out gradually or you're apt to tear your wings off. What about mental spins? How do I pull out of them? About time we were heading for the barn. But before we do, I want to show you how this airplane flies on instruments. See how our gas is. Look at that B-26 moving in on us. Yeah, we'll have to keep our eye on him. Transfer gas to the main tanks. I'm going on instruments for a minute, and I want you to keep your eye on that B-26 from my side while I'm flying blind. Yes, sir. Hand me the blind flying hood. Watch that 26 from your side, Jim. I'm going to let down to 4,000 feet to show you how easy it is to set a constant rate of descent in a B-26. Watching the instruments? Them and that 26. Nose down slightly and trim. Check airspeed. What's the fuel pressure? Zero. Flip on the booster. No rise in pressure. 
The field's inside. Do you think we can make it? I think so. I'm going to feather that dead engine. Watch me. The ignition switch is left on until the propeller has stopped turning. I center my ball and needle and slow up to 155, increasing my trim as I do. Isn't that a lot of trim, Dick? You need it because of the natural torque of the operating engine. Going on the right engine requires about five degrees more trim than if you were going on the left. The slower I go, the more trim I need. But I've got to watch that needle and ball while trimming. What's the airspeed? 155. Between 150 and 160 is correct. But 155 is plenty fast for single engine operation. Shall I give them the bad news back at the tower? The tower from 7645. I'm about eight miles west of field, 4,000 feet, operating on a single engine. Request instructions for emergency landing. Go ahead. 7645 from the tower. The field is clear for emergency landing. Wind is south 10. Go ahead. 24 inches manifold pressure. Landing gear down and check your instruments. Gabriel didn't blow his horn. Check your hydraulic pressure gauge. Got the nose down again to hold 155. You're on the field side, so you'll have to tell me when to turn. I can hardly wait. Now's the time, Dick. But you're plenty high, you're certain to overshoot. That's the whole point of this type of approach. Always overshoot. Never in any circumstances undershoot. You can always dive off excess altitude. The next step is to decrease the power on my operating engine until it's virtually shut off. And then trim a few degrees to the other side. One quarter flat. One half flat. What's my airspeed? 155. That's minimum for this kind of a glide. More flaps now? No, not until I'm positive I'm going to overshoot. 
Okay, full flaps. I picked up some speed on my dive and I'll have to lose it by holding the nose up and letting the ship scoot. Notice how straight she rolls, with no tendency to ground loop. Boy, these brakes are really good. You can slap her at 1,500 feet. Interesting, Captain. I hope you committed that reasonable facsimile of a single engine approach to memory. Well, I certainly did. Say, by the way, what would you have done if you'd had to stop in a hurry and didn't have any hydraulic pressure? I'd have had you give me more pressure on the hydraulic hand pump. If that hadn't worked, I'd have pulled the emergency air bottle, which is connected directly with the brakes. Well, that's the fastest stop you can make, huh? No, well, there's an even faster one. If you're going to run into something or the field is slick and you can't get any traction on your wheels, you can, as a last resort, pull back your mixture controls, cut your switches, and raise your landing gear. That'll stop you, but it's a little hard on the airplane. Just one more question, Dick. Suppose we hadn't been able to make our home field. We would have picked out any field that was fairly flat and free from obstructions, brought the ship in on its belly. Aside from the wheels being up, the landing would have been the same as the one we made. I know, but uh, what about getting out? Well, if we'd had time, we'd have got out of our parachutes and pushed the seats forward to get out of the path of the propeller in case one of the blades should break off when it hits the ground. Then just before we touched, I'd have pushed the mixture controls back to idle cutoff cut the switches to keep down the fire hazard. Then the minute she touched, we'd have got the top hatches open, and then we'd have all got up and quickly walked away. Good afternoon, sir. I have an emergency landing to report. Yes, the tower informed me you were coming in, and I watched you. It was a good job. Thank you, sir. Those simulated single-engine approaches you've been making came in handy for you, didn't they? Yes, sir. The airplane was undamaged, and there were no personnel injuries. What was the reason for the engine failure? It was a personnel failure, sir. No. Sit down, gentlemen. Corporal Smith, our engineer, made a mistake in turning on the fuel transfer pump emptying the left main tank instead of filling it. However, it was more my fault than his because I had him watching a nearby plane while I flew on instruments, and I neglected to keep an eye on my fuel gauges. And where were you? 
Sandbagging it in the co-pilot seat, sir. Sandbagging is right. That's another lesson for your collection, Captain. Live and learn. And I hope neither of you will forget it. I'm positive that Corporal Smith, or rather Private Smith, will not, since he's going to get some KP duty in which to meditate upon his sins. How do you like the B-26, Lieutenant? I'm not kicking, sir. Hmm. Only our enemies are. It was one of the most feared aircraft combat of World War II. Yet throughout its dramatic history, it was plagued by an early reputation as being far too dangerous to fly. The B-26 Martin Marauder I was just petrified when I realized here I was on an airbase full of those creatures. And I was going to have to be a pilot in one of them. Now, the true story of its journey from death trap to fearsome adversary can be told. It down to rubble. We went twice a day. So we finally knocked it down and killed every German big enough to die. After the end of the First World War and the Treaty of Versailles, America was determined to stay out of international disputes. It adopted a policy of go at it alone and retreated into a long period of isolation. For almost 20 years, the U.S. armed forces fell way behind those of modernizing Europe. In Europe, air superiority was recognized as a key to successful modern warfare. It was a time of major technical developments with new theories and tactics for the new generation of fighter bombers. But by 1933, with Hitler's appointment as Chancellor, Germany had embarked on a rearmament program of ethic proportions. The Nazi machine began to replace all its old warplanes and produce a new generation of bombers. Yet, across the Atlantic, American aviation remained very much the world of small-town barnstormers. Latest American aeronautical innovation was geared towards luxurious commercial use, with new stylish all-metal aircraft like the Boeing 247 and the DC-3. America's air power was simply not up to modern air combat standards. America pays too little attention to the rise of Nazism in Europe and too late does it identify the danger of Japanese expansionism. Now one of the consequences of all this isolationism is that America had fallen behind in several key military areas and aircraft was one of these. And on the eve of war, the Americans knew that they had to catch up and fast. So in March 1939, a competition was urgently held for a new high-speed and heavily armed aircraft. The history on it is that the brass and the Air Force wanted a medium bomber with speed that could uh, more or less defend itself without fighter escort and was fast enough to evade fighters. Most importantly of all, the new bomber had to be able to get into production immediately. After just four months, the result of the competition were announced. The winner was a revolutionary twin-engine medium bomber designed by the Glenn L. Martin Company. The new aircraft had been designed by a young team led by a 26-year-old aeronautical engineer, Peyton M. Marauder. 
Magruder's radical new design was a sleek, heavily armed aircraft, incorporating the latest aeronautical technology with short wings for high-speed performance. The aircraft had a top speed of 300 miles an hour. With developments in Europe causing increasing alarm, the U.S. Army Air Corps was now under pressure to rearm and needed immediate delivery. Taking an unprecedented step, Martin's new design was ordered to go straight from the drawing board into production. There will be no prototype for testing. This unique off-the-shelf purchase was to sow seeds of disaster in the years to come. Just weeks after the contract was awarded, the expected war in Europe erupted. In a rush, the Army Air Corps ordered additional modifications of extra armor plating, torpedo racks, and a top gun turret, all of which substantially increased the weight of the aircraft. But there was no time for evaluation or testing. The very first of this new generation of warplanes were delivered straight to the U.S. Army Air Corps. My first impression, going out to the flight line and joining with the first pilot, the instructor pilot, was that I was getting into something that would be the most modern that I had envisioned of anything flying up to that point. And so I knew that I was in something different when I first climbed into that cockpit area. My first impression that compared with what we'd been flying, it was a large aircraft. And I had had no experience in an airplane that size. Also, it looked uh, somewhat formidable with its four-bladed props and its guns in the tail, and the guns around the body of the fuselage, and a little gun in the navigator's compartment. So it was a forbidding-looking airplane. Magruder was an innovator and incorporated many new advanced design features, which included tricycle landing gear, an old plexiglass nose, and the latest electrical bomb sight. But the additional weight of the Army's modifications had also turned Magruder's streamlined aircraft into a potential killer. The twin-engine bomber now required extremely skilled handling from the new pilots, especially for takeoffs and landings. One of the first ones I flew was an 11th airplane off the line. And they were having quite a lot of problems with it. And if I recall, the second day I was there, one of them went in off the end of the runway and exploded. And let's say that got my attention. I had a feeling that I was uh, trying to learn to fly something that was quite a bit more of an airplane than the trainers I had flown in flying school. And so it was a thrill and also a hint of caution that I'd better handle it very carefully and still be aggressive enough to learn to fly it as well as my instructor. Due to a lack of testing, the new aircraft suffered from a series of problems. Nose wheel struts collapsed, hydraulic lines leaked, fuel lines clogged, and the yet untested four-bladed propellers regularly failed. To make matters worse, by the autumn of 1941, difficulties arose in material shortages in the defense industry. Aluminum and propellers were just not available. The airplanes were coming off the assembly line, but there were no props. So we would fly an airplane from Baltimore to Barksdale and take the props off and, and get them back up to Baltimore and do this again and bring airplanes down. By the end of 1941, the Martin factory finally completed the first delivery of 261 aircraft to the U.S. Air Corps.
The delivery was just in time to be deployed in the front line of American forces in the desperate days after Pearl Harbor. New pilots were now urgently needed for combat, but within months this aircraft was proving too hot to handle. With an alarmingly high number of deadly accidents, the B-26 Marauder quickly gained the notorious reputation as the Widowmaker. I was just petrified when I realized here I was on an airbase full of those creatures and I was going to have to be a pilot in one of them. In February 1942, the Martin B-26 Marauder had its baptism of fire in the Pacific War. This was the most advanced medium-range bomber in the world, but early combat operations were marred by one disaster after another. For the new, hastily trained pilots, it soon earned a reputation as a death trap. Coming right out of flying school and going over to Barksdale Field from Arizona, I really didn't know very much about it except that it was new. But once I got there, I began to hear these stories. And then I kind of wondered what I was getting into. They called it the Widowmaker, which it made lots of widows. They called it the Baltimore Whore, which is a bad word, but that, they said, it had no visible means of support. And uh, the Flying Torpedo, uh, they had a lot of bad names for it. Trainee pilots were finding the B-26 too hot to handle. With fast landing speeds of 125 miles an hour, trainees would bring it in too slow. It would then stall, spin, and crash. You had more of a fighter plane feel to that airplane. When you came in for a landing, you didn't just bring it in in a nice controlled sliding approach. You brought it in a very steep angle. And then at the very last minute, you would flare it out. And if your timing was right, you would kind of grease it on. If not, you'd splatter it pretty hard. Or if you did it too high, you would hit pretty hard. Pilots in training were having serious problems learning to fly the new bomber. I actually had 10 of them walk in one morning and place their wings on my desk. And they got the choice of being mess officers or going down to Trinidad and flying B-18s on sub patrol. We had five or six pilots that finally gave up flying. They just re refused to fly any more combat. And I had unfortunately made a statement to a another pilot that I was flying co-pilot for, he was a very ham-handed pilot, and he just frightened, the, he really flight frightened the daylights out of me the way he flew. So when I got back on the ground after this one mission, I told him, I'm never going to fly combat again if I have to fly with you. Ground crews were also experiencing severe problems in maintaining and servicing the new aircraft. We had a lot of tire problems, and if an airplane blew a tire right at liftoff, it usually killed the crew. And sometimes if you came in and the tire was shot up, one tire was shot up and he landed, well, a lot of times it did kill the crew also. The results were a series of deadly accidents. By early 1942, in a period of just 30 days, 15 B-26s were written off in crashes. On a day in Tampa Bay, that was the motto. I lost a bunch of friends. They had seven of us graduate from cadet school at Luke Field. We, they had, had us flying fighters out there. And in six weeks, out of the seven, me and Pete Graves, only two left alive. The other five were out there swimming around. By now, the Committee on Military Affairs, headed by Senator Harry Truman, had begun to investigate the reasons behind so many fatalities. Were Martin's B-26 Marauders a death trap for American airmen? After 165 accidents and dozens of trainee crew killed, the Truman Committee recommended that all production and flying should be halted. But the Air Force still had faith in the plane. 
and gave the responsibility of salvaging his reputation to General James Doolittle, commander of the celebrated Tokyo Raid of April 1942. It would be a do-or-die operation. Jimmy Doolittle probably the best pilot that we ever had. He had flown uh, air races, and uh, he was a B-26 advocate. He thought it was a good airplane. He was always someplace flying. He was not a guy that was a desk jockey. And as a result, he was a pilot's pilot. And he came down and actually landed it on one engine, and he flew around and, and rung it out over the top of the airport while all the young pilots were standing there watching it. And they said, Jesus, if he can do that, we can too. You knew that there was a man that had flown a lot of airplanes and knew what he was doing. And he pushed the limits a little bit because uh, he made tighter turns than the rest of us <laughs> and scared a little of, uh, but we knew that we had a guy that knew what his limits were. The report revealed that the causes of the accidents were due mainly to the inexperience of the pilots and maintenance mechanics, along with the increased heavyweight of the airframe. To stop further problems with the dangerously overloaded planes, the engineers introduced a more powerful engine and also extended the wings by three feet. This made the plane much easier to control, especially takeoffs and landings. Doolittle organized a new training program for both pilots and mechanics. Flying demonstrations were performed by the legendary test pilot Vincent Squeak Burnett to boost morale and renew faith in the Marauder. Here's the jack sir. Take a look, Jim. Since you're going to be a B-26 pilot, that's your Bible. Uh, left landing gear and wheel well check. Well, that uh, U-lock the crew member's removing is a safety precaution we have to prevent anyone from raising the landing gear while the ship's on the ground. You don't mean to tell me that's ever happened. That and worse. Now get on with that checklist and see that none of those other things ever happen to you. You fly for a while, Jim. Get the feel of the control. See how easily she handles. Controls are easy, aren't they? Smooth as a GI haircut. Doolittle's training program had rescued the B-26 from congressional action. But the stigma of the Widowmaker would not go. The Marauder would have to prove its critics wrong where it mattered, in combat. And now, the moment had come as the B-26 Marauder headed for the war in the deserts of North Africa. In November 1942, the 319th B-26 Bomb Group joined American forces in support of Operation Torch, the amphibious landings in North Africa. But using the new medium bomber for low-level ground attack operations could easily be disastrous. Early missions were riddled with organizational chaos. What happened in Africa that we had no strategy whatsoever? And there was no bombing strategy, there was no coordination, there was no photographs, maps of the target. They were hand-drawn maps. In fact, our first flight that went out with five planes, none of them come back. The crews of the B-26 Marauders were capable of delivering a devastating attack, dropping up to 4,000 pounds of high-explosive bombs the Air Force tried and tested new tactics with mass squadron formation flying at medium altitude and bombing a single target for maximum effectiveness. The accuracy of hitting the target was dependent on the combined skills of the pilot and the lead bombardier with his sophisticated Norden bombsite. The general routine was you had an initial point, they called it, a specific geographic point on the ground, you would turn then and go to what they call the AP, the aiming point. And as you went toward the aiming point, the uh, bombardier would get his Norden bombsite, which was an early model of a computer. He would get it 
organized so that he'd say left, left, right, right, up, up, down, down, whatever, to get the pilot and that that um, computer going together. The Norton bomb site was one of the U.S. Air Force's most secret weapons. This early computer calculated exactly when and where to drop the bombs, allowing for altitude, airspeed, and crosswinds. And so when you get to your point and you call the pilot and say, okay, I have it, and you go straight and left, and you look in front of you and it looks like thunder clouds, it's black, it's uh, dirty, uh, you feel like, and you almost could, that you could see the Germans at their gun positions. Then we would go on through, all we could do is just sit there like this, because the airplane was being flown by that computer. It's a moment of truth where everybody has to stop wiggling around, trying to evade the flak and wade through. You lean over and when you do, you go to the eyepiece and you're watching the crosshairs that are moving. You stop them and that means you've corrected to the ground speed. And when they get together, the bombs are gone. The minute he'd say, bombs away, then, boy, we had our hands on the control. Sometimes both of us would be, you know, getting it into whatever direction we'd pre-planned for the breakaway. I am stand still. <laughs> Trust me, it's, it's a long, long run when it really is probably three to four minutes, five minutes. But it seems a lot longer than that. The home run to the target for the crews of the Marauder was no easy ride. Done our job, dropped, dropped the bombs. We encountered some flak and some fighters, but my airplane didn't get hit. And uh, we were all assembled and going back to our base. But on one mission, one of the Marauders was hit by flak and unable to rejoin the formation. We were supposed to all stay together, and if guy got crippled, it was his tough luck, but... I didn't dare. I didn't want to do that. This guy was out there by himself. He could have been picked off. But I got close enough to be tightened up for defensive purposes. Take a look at him. Well, he was flying straight and level, trying to keep it going, but he had to fly slower because he was crippled. So I had a camera there that we all had that if something unusual occurred, you could use a camera if you weren't busy fighting off something. And while the other guy flew the airplane, I took this picture myself. I noticed what was wrong. Both engines were moving, but under, underneath, there was a big gash in the left wing. There were holes all along the side of it facing me. This airplane flew all the way back. It was some, it must have been about 150 miles or so that he flew back with me on his wing. He couldn't make a normal landing. He made a belly landing. Got those gear, the wheels up, skidded in. Nobody was injured inside, but the airplane was really wrecked. The Marauder was not only capable of surviving severe punishment, but was also recognized as a valuable kit of spare parts. If it hadn't been for airplanes belly and in, we would have not have made it. That was our spare parts, airplanes belly and in, and as soon as we, we had a crew of people that went over and took parts off the airplane, and we said, had them put back in a storage so we could have them when we needed them. In terms of belly landings as being a source of a possible crash, nobody really worried about that. We could skid that doggone thing right in, whether it was on mud or on a paved runway or not. And if we had to do it, we'd do it. And in fact, most people would rather make a belly landing than get it up there and bail out and let the airplane fall. In the first three weeks of operation in North Africa alone, the D-26s of the 319th Bomb Group had flown just 20 missions. Now, it was the B-26's combat losses that were called into question. Within weeks, the American forces in North Africa had joined the British 8th Army in defending the feared German Africa Corps. The Air Force continued to experiment with the B-26 bombing at different altitudes, but soon realized that it was most effective between 10 and 12,000 feet, exactly the height it was originally designed for. 
the first three or four missions, we we went from the deck up to about 3,000 to 4,000, 5,000. It still wasn't enough. But very soon we learned uh, that you had to get up above 7,500 feet to be safe from the kind of anti-aircraft, light anti-aircraft flak that they threw up at you. You knew you were going to be attacked coming out of the target area. So you had to get back into tight formation quickly so that your gunners would have the mass effect for the German planes who were coming trying to attack us. They'd like to have us scattered out, pick us off one at a time. And uh, so we didn't, uh, we didn't want to have that happen. The B-26 Marauder had proved to be a tough and durable aircraft. We had them come back with half the tail shot away and uh, engine shot out. A uh, 26 would absorb a lot of, a lot of damage. It just seemed to me like that that engine was well built. It would take a lot of beating. We had occasions where engines were shot out. Uh, oh, we've been beat up any number of times uh, where you get damage to the plane. Uh, there are even occasions where the crew, parts of the crews were killed. The plane came back. The Marauder was fast earning a reputation as a deadly precision bomber. And at the Casablanca conference in January 1943, Winston Churchill persuaded Roosevelt to continue with the Mediterranean campaign to force Italy out of the war and draw German forces from the Russian front, preparing the ground for the invasion of France. In the Allied invasion of Italy, Martin's marauders would add another deadly chapter to their history by taking part in one of the most famous and controversial conflicts of the Second World War the Battle of Monte Cassino. By 1943, a change of tactics from low-level to median altitude bombing and the combat experience of the Marauder crews had finally brought a change of fortune. The Marauders were having increasing success on their bombing missions. But flying into enemy flak was always a terrifying experience. We could look ahead, and I remember saying to the uh, pilot, I nudged him, I said, what in the hell is that? He looked at it and he said, you've seen flak before. I said, that's flak? Well, here was this solid black band with red flashes all through it. Well, the Germans had already picked up our altitude, direction, and everything else, so they were just laying a barrage into our flight path. And I don't know how we got through that. I mean, you can almost walk on this stuff. It's big black puffs. And when you have one where your airplane shutters, that means you done got took on some of this stuff. When you could see flak, then it was reasonably close. When you could uh, hear it, it was very close. When you could smell it or feel it, it was terribly close, within 40 feet of you. Well, that's what we felt all the way through that black cloud was the aircraft just bouncing and the smell of cordite or whatever that powder is. Uh, we could feel the stuff, we could hear it, we could smell it. I was there as we were on the bomb run before we got to the target and we were getting an awful lot of flak, but pieces began to fly off of our lead ship, I mean, bouncing off of us. And uh, it was a scary experience. I had to try to keep straight and level while we're going, trying to get on our target. But uh, in doing that and uh, worrying about the bursts of flak that were coming all around, uh, all of a sudden we found out I, there was a bump on my head, bang, like somebody hit me with a hammer and knocked my uh, goggles flying and whatever else I had on my head to protect my, my skull. But uh, just was a sudden shock. And what had happened was that a piece of flak came right through plexiglass, right straight ahead of me. And of course, if I'd have been done like our my grade school teachers used to say, sit up straight, Conlon, I'd have been dead and I would have gone right through here. Fortunately, I was a little slumped 
and it went right through here, it grazed the top of my scalp, but it hit hard, drew a lot of blood. It was a shock, it was a, it was a surprise, and I knew, was, uh, I didn't know how bad it was, and then, but I was not unconscious, so I, I could still function, but I had to get this blood stopped, so the, the next thing happened was someone was bandaging me, and the other guy was flying the airplane, till we could get uh, back out of this flak, and uh, fighters, fighters were now coming in, too. I had a whopping headache for the next day, but other than that, I, I was okay. The Allied invasion of Italy was launched in September 1943. In an attempt to hold the threatened city of Rome, the Germans constructed a series of defensive lines. The last and most formidable, the Gustav Line was anchored on the heavily fortified garrison town of Cassino. Strategically, Monte Cassino is absolutely pivotal. It's a formidably strong mountainous area right in the middle of the Gustav Line, which protects the direct route for the Allies to take Rome. Now, what had happened in early 1944 is that not only had a direct assault on the Gustav Line failed, but the Allies had tried to get round it by going to Anzio, and that also had stalled. So one way or the other, they were going to have to solve the problem of Monte Cassino. Throughout the weeks of heavy fighting, the sacred monastery of Monte Cassino had been left untouched. This 5th century monastery, founded by St. Benedict, was internationally renowned as a place of holiness, culture, and art. But the Allies suspected that it was the base for the German defenders. In a highly controversial move, it was ordered to be destroyed. And of course, all the Catholic people and all, all totally freaked out because you ain't supposed to do that. You know, it's a, it's a shrine. Well, it ain't no shrine if the Germans are in there with machine guns killing our boys. Gentlemen, we all know the purpose of this operation against the Pino. Tiny works like this, sir. The attack will be open by medium bombers, beginning with the B-25s, tactical air force. Then come the heavies in waves of 15-minute intervals. Following the heavies, the B-26s will complete the attack. And uh, during the briefing there, as I say, we had a Catholic chaplain get up and asked if any Catholic present, and there were some, you know, in every group. And the next question was, do you want to go? And if you don't want to, you don't have to. Yeah, but the Pope said, give them hell. So we did. The sky was full of every kind of aircraft that I knew of in that whole uh, Southern European theater. The B-17s, B-24s, the uh, P-47 dive bombers, the Spitfires that we had covering us, the P-51s that had just come in. Everything was in the air. The Germans were firmly dug in, and as the formation of marauders approached to Monte Cassino, the skies were ablaze from the flak of the German guns. We are getting shot up pretty good, but you see, the pilot, he don't see a lot. In other words, he goes up there on the lead ship. Now, he flies the airplane up to this bomb run, and at that point, the Norden bomb site takes over. Well, I remember seeing the casino. It was a white building sitting up there. To me, it looked like a white picket fence, you know, around it. And we made our bomb run. And as we was making our bomb run, uh, we came in and the, uh, dropped our bombs and I could see them exploding from one end to the other of the casino and nothing but dust underneath there. On February the 15th, 1944, to the shock of the world, the monastery was leveled. The accuracy of the B-26's bombing proved without a shadow of a doubt that, if properly used, Martin's aircraft was a potent weapon. It was solid stone, you know. Them friars built a heck of a, <laughs> heck of a shrine. They, the, the walls on that thing were six, eight foot thick. 
The bombing of Monte Cassino was a tragedy. Ironically, the bombing itself worked reasonably well. The B-26s did a good job, the bombing was quite accurate, and the monastery itself was leveled. The Germans then occupied the ruins, and the Allies simply weren't able to get them out of the ruins. Thus, although the bombing worked in the short term, the Allied operation to smash a hole through the Gustav line failed. It was, however, a turning point for the Marauder. The introduction of the Norden bomb site, the quality of bombs it could deliver, and the speed and handling of the aircraft had all combined to make it a formidable machine. The Marauder could now literally deliver bombs on a button. Following the Mediterranean campaign and the fall of Rome, the B-26 Marauder and its crew's reputation was going from one victory to the next. Despite its notorious birth as the flying coffin, the Marauder was proving to be an outstanding airplane and feared adversary. The improved bombing accuracy and switch to medium altitude tactics meant that the Marauder had now come into their own. D-Day would provide the Marauders with new challenges. The B-26s were called upon to soften up the enemy in an intense pre-landing bombardment. They played a key role in attacking German troop movements, communications, and defenses. And when the Allies invaded southern France, the B-26s helped to neutralize the heavily fortified southern French ports of Bordeaux and Toulon. Designated as fortress by Hitler, the port of Toulon was dominated by hundreds of shore batteries and anti-aircraft guns. If the harbor was to be captured, the guns had to be destroyed. From 10 to 11,000 feet, we could put 90% of the bombs in the 600-foot circle. We could hit the target, we could defend ourselves, and hit it and get back. In 48 separate missions, losing just eight aircraft, the Marauders dropped one of the most concentrated barrages of the war. Never before had the Marauder's ability as a precision bomber proved so effective. On August the 23rd, 1944, Toulon fell. The Allies' successful campaign continued across occupied France, and by August 1944, Paris was liberated. Now, with Germany buckling under, the Marauders were deployed in bombing enemy defensive positions on the eastern side of Rhine. The medium bombers were ideally suited to destroy the enemy's road and rail networks. In the final months of the war in Europe, the formidable B-26 crews were flying a record number of missions, often under heavy attack. The much maligned medium bomber now had a reputation for flying into battle and achieving pinpoint accuracy. The Marauder was also admired by its crew for its strength and ability to take the intense punishment. Towards the end of the war, on a bombing mission across the Rhine, B-26 bombardier Charles News had an experience he will never forget. We were just uh, 20 miles or so from Strasbourg, and we took a hit. Then the next hit, uh, the guy I think was in the bomb bay. And at that point, we realized that we were hit. We were not going to make it. It was chaotic. You know, neither neither engine was doing what it was supposed to do. We had fire. I could see the fire. You know, there was no mystery about it. The co-pilot was uh, sitting, <laughs> trying to get out, uh, which he couldn't. Uh, but uh, his parachute strap had caught on the seat. Uh, the release to the co-pilot seat was between the pedals. I could reach it. I did reach it. I pulled her sideways, and he went backwards. After successfully releasing the co-pilot, 
news was able to make his escape from the bombardier's position. So we got the co-pilot, he was the first one out. Uh, we got him through. The top turret gunner was dead. A tail gunner and radio gunner made their dramatic escape, bailing out past the landing gear, leaving just news in the pilot in the plane. We were trying to debate whether or not we would stay with the plane because we could see the Rhine River and we could see safety and home. We finally got to the point saying, no, 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 we're gonna, gonna take the way out and out we went. I remember the tremendous quiet as you're hanging on a parachute, swinging gently in the breeze, you hope, and everybody's gone, everybody's left you. I was not heroic. I knew when I was caught and I stopped and promptly showed my hands and stood still. And so then, then it was taken for his In May 1945, Victory over Nazi Germany was complete. By the end of the war, the record of marauders was outstanding. Its bombing accuracy had made an important contribution to winning the war in Europe. The B-26 had made aviation history. With an enviable record for survival, its actual combat losses were fewer than any other Allied bombers in the war. Dogged by its reputation as a widowmaker from cradle to its grave, this remarkable plane was tragically buried without the military honors it so richly deserved. With the war over in the late autumn of 1945, the 500 remaining B-26s were blown up for scrap in Germany. Ironically, the aluminum was collected to help rebuild the devastated German metal industry. I would say that considering its birth, when it came out and how many people it killed, it was a bad airplane. Now, as we learned to fly it and as the mechanics learned to maintain it, it became a good airplane. It had holes all over the airplane and still it was flying. Come home on one engine and fly almost the whole distance on it. And that was a pleasant surprise. And so that we kind of loved that airplane after seeing what it did for us in so many missions. That was probably one of the greatest aircraft that we ever had in the military in those days. In terms of its ability to take a terrible, terrible beating, and that was one thing that made it uh, tenable for us to fly that airplane and keep on flying it, because we knew that sucker would bring us back. You know, it might be hard getting back, but it would get us back. Well, of course, uh, coming right out of flying school and going over to Barksdale Field from Arizona, I really didn't know very much about it except that it was new. But once I got there, I began to hear these stories, and then I kind of wondered what I was getting into. But nevertheless, it was a challenge, and I listened, but some of the stories uh, described it as a widow maker, a flying prostitute, no visible means of support, uh, and a several other uh, less flattering terms. One a day in Tampa Bay, <laughs> and that sort of thing. So uh, it was a little daunting, uh, but that was the problem that uh, we had to, to overcome to be sure that any of us that were going to learn to fly it and the later go into combat would have to put that aside if we we're going to be successful. And so we made a go at that. Uh, some didn't do so well with that and a few quit along the way. But uh, most of us did go with it and uh, learned well enough to fly that airplane. And one thing we learned as we were going along is that either you fly it or it'll fly you. <laughs>